It's foggy. It's foggy. And I haven't revisited that um, in uh, 40 years. Maybe 50. <clears throat> um, The stuttering was an issue, um, the constant D's and F's in school was an issue. My parents got me a tutor to work with me to help try to improve my grades by teaching me how to do long division and those kinds of things. And uh, the uh, they sent me to study how to play the accordion, a uh, 12 bass accordion, and to play drums and to tap dance. And the thinking was that if I was not able to express myself verbally, perhaps I could express myself through one of these artistic um, modems and break through and gain some degree of confidence that could somehow release whatever it was that was uh, causing the stutter and the abysmal behavior in school. And I briefly went through a, a, a time with a therapist to see if we could find or identify a time or a place in my life where the stuttering began because my parents did not remember me stuttering as a very young child, that it just kind of came over me, as it does with many. Um, so I learned how to play the accordion, and uh, I learned how to play the drums, and uh, I did a fair shuffle step at age 14 with my tap shoes, none of which would qualify me for any performance work today, mind you, but it was fun, and I liked it, and it put a smile on my face. And um, as a result of that, I just felt a little differently at school. And maybe there was a little lift in my gait, and I began to make a couple of friends. I still was t t talking l l like that, but I was n noticing that there were times where a couple of sentences flew by where, 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 where I, I, I didn't fall back into the pattern as much as I did. Didn't quite know why, but I kept tapping. And I developed two friends. Remember, Harvey and Harold were my two friends. They lived, um, I think, in the same building as mine. Maybe one lived a, a building away. I remember two events that occurred around that time of the transition. One was meeting a jazz musician named Frank. He was a guy who lived in the neighborhood. He was older than other, the rest of us. Uh, we were, you know, in our early well, I don't know, 13, 14, 15 years old around there. He, he may have been in his late 20s. He was a jazz musician. And he had this really cool room in his parents' apartment, two or three blocks from where we lived. And we would go there in the afternoon to visit him, Harold, Harvey, and myself. And he introduced us to jazz. And he just had this one room, it was a bedroom, but he had a great uh, sound system. And he started playing Thelonious Monk, Horace Silver, Ornette Coleman, John Coltrane. I'd never heard jazz. You know, I thought it began and ended with Elvis and he opened the door to jazz. And one day, we were there, and he was explaining to us something about jazz and playing the music, and while he was doing it, he was smoking a joint. Mm -hmm. And this is when? I don't know, I was 13, 14, 15, around then. Wow. All of us were. 
Harvey, Harold, and myself. And uh, Frank just lit up a joint. And he unceremoniously, just kind of matter-of-factly, took it and put it in uh, either Harold or Harvey's hand. And I think both of them uh, looked at it and put it in my hand. And I remember what Frank did with it. And I did the same thing that Frank did. And I inhaled. And then I handed it back to Frank. Then I leaned back a little and listened to Ornette Coleman's album, The Shape of Things to Come, for either 15 minutes or 15 hours. I can't quite recall at this moment, but I had never, I had never heard jazz before. It wasn't popular in the Mint's household. Right. And I had never smoked marijuana before. And um, those two forces met. And at the risk of oversimplification, in the weeks and months that followed, I stuttered less, became a little bit more sociable, and slightly more popular. I had heard uh, friends of mine say, Elliot seems to have changed. And Elliot had. I was 15, 16 years old, and we started going down to the village. And we went to places like Cafe Wa and the Finjon and the Big Black Fat Pussycat. And I would go there to listen to jazz artists, jazz musicians, on the weekends. Just take the train from 190th down to West 4th Street. My parents didn't object. Uh, it was cool. I, I was with my two friends, went down there. They knew I was listening to jazz. They didn't know what else I was doing, but they knew I was listening to jazz. And um, the music helped liberate me. And I also saw uh, a different neighborhood. And in the neighborhood, I saw beatniks. I saw guys who wore black um, turtleneck shirts, berets, and uh, they read poems. And they listened to jazz, and they played music, and they hung around Washington Square Park on a Sunday afternoon. And they had bongo drums. They had bongo drums, they had some tambourines. They had um, those very tall drums. What are they called, Jim? The kind um, that you see in the Caribbean all the yeah, time. Yeah, I know what you're saying. Conga drums? Conga drums, yeah. Congas. Um, and there was a whole street scene. And there were black people. Unlike my neighborhood, there were people of color. And they were with uh, white people. And there were older people and there were younger people. And there were some girls who looked a lot different than the girls in my neighborhood, who dressed a lot different. And uh, the girls in my neighborhood, um, their last names for the most part were Horowitz and Rabinowitz. They dressed very conservatively and they sometimes would allow you to take, uh, carry their books home from school and you could take them just to the front of their apartment building. It was very nice. But I was going to the village and I met um, uh, girls whose last names were Moreno. Mm -hmm. uh, Hispanic and Puerto Rican girls. So pot, jazz, <laughs> and women called Moreno. That's a good combination. It's not sex, drugs, and rock and roll yet, but it's on the way. <laughs>